I don't suppose I'll ever forget when Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh came to Tasmania. We'd all been looking forward to it for such a long time that when the middle of February did come, we could hardly believe they would soon be here. Everybody was talking about it at home, and the people next door even lent us some of their flags. In some of the streets, there was quite a competition to see who could make the best display of decoration. We'd never seen the town looking so gay before. Everybody was working as hard as to make things look their best. In the old town, the buildings were yellow and golden, fresh with the color and the light of the sun. Besides the decorations, we had to get ready for our display too and make sure that everybody knew just what to do on the big day when the Queen and the Duke would be watching us. We were not the only ones who had to practice. The soldiers had to take special drill too, so that no one would make a mistake. Out at Government House, the gardens were looking glorious. There were flowers and shrubs of every kind. And in the city, Elizabeth Street made a wonderful sight. Dad had a trip to the north. He said it was just the same wherever you went. All the towns were busy with their preparations. And some of them had been to all kinds of trouble and expense. Daddy said there were more arches on the northwest than anywhere else. I would have liked to have seen them all. And there were flags flying, red, white, and blue everywhere. But goodness, the weather was a worry, though. I think everyone was watching the sky all day long. Here came. We knew our luck was in. The day had begun with all its dignity and excitement. Sailors, soldiers, People from town and country took up their positions to wait for the arrival of the Queen. The sun was warm and the waiting long, and the decorations did not adorn buildings only. With traditional ceremony, the Navy arrived to stand guard on Prince's Wharf, where the crown and a map of Tasmania were raised above the heads of the people. Many of us went out on the ferry, gaily, for we hoped to be first to see the Queen. And there rode Gothic on the Derwent. Across the expanse of the broad harbour, we went out to meet her, to see the ship cut against the summer hills in the clear, sharp morning light. There was barely a breath to stir the air. The yachts moved gently, becalmed in the still of the day. Gothic moved past them, stately and serene, towards the land and the city. Here, where we live in close unity with the rising mountains, people lined the foreshore as the ship came into port. The blue of the sky colored and defined the outlines of the whole harbor. It was a glorious morning.
The Queen and Duke had watched from the bridge on the long run to Sullivan's Cove. Now we welcomed them by land as well as by sea, while we waited for them to step ashore. The showing of the color began. In a moment, we would see the Queen. Queen Elizabeth is here. Her first act is to inspect the Guard of Honor. While the officer walks with sword at the carry, she performs the age-old duty with the Duke of Edinburgh. Every eye is focused on that small square below. Our welcome is no longer noisy. It is quiet. But it is as sincere as the greetings of the Premier and of members of the Parliament when they speak for Tasmania this morning. Police, who have been training for months, will escort the royal party to the town hall. From this historic wharf, with its memories of sailing ships and whaling trade, of merchants and settlers, the Queen and Duke make their way to the heart of the city. The Lord Mayor, Sir Richard Harris, and Lady Harris receive the royal party. Their reception is given on behalf of the citizens of Hobart, who had gathered not only at the town hall, but at various places along the route the Queen and Duke were to take. Queen Elizabeth listens to the loyal address read by Sir Richard. He recalls the visit of Her Majesty's parents 26 years ago and expresses pleasure in the pleasant opportunity of reaffirming our loyalty. We wish you and His Royal Highness continued good health and happiness on your tour. My Lord Mayor, it is a great pleasure for me to arrive at the second oldest city in Australia, and I thank you most sincerely for the warmth of your welcome to my husband and myself. Your reception of us today, both on land and on water, indicates the fellowship and understanding which exists between Tasmania and the mother country. I look forward to my stay here amongst you, and through you, my Lord Mayor, send greetings and good wishes to all the citizens of Hobart. The presentations of the aldermen and their wives are carried out in an atmosphere of informal friendliness. Then it is time for the Queen and Duke to leave for Government House.
Out at Government House, the boys and girls of this young state, the guides, scouts, and brownies, stand waiting under old English trees, which will be a familiar sight to the Queen at the end of her journey. The governor, Sir Ronald Cross, and Lady Cross welcome them into their home. It is now given to them to use as they wish in their moments of rest. I didn't see Queen Elizabeth at Government House because we were all waiting excitedly down at the Oval. and cheered again and again and made just as much noise as we could. that our pictures were just like them. Our director and his wife were presented to Queen Elizabeth. Of course, I don't know them to speak to, but morning Padgett came from our school. I was so anxious that she wouldn't make a mistake, so when the time came, I forgot all about it. She looked so pretty. Then it was our turn. One boy said that the girls weren't nearly as good as they were, but I don't believe him for one minute. I know I tried, and we didn't forget that the Queen and the Duke were watching us. a new pattern, we had to make sure that we followed the leaders and kept in step. We had practiced and practiced until we even knew the movements in our sleep. Just the same, when our pattern marching drew near the end, I knew it had been a success. The girls from the Catholic school came after us to give their ball display. They moved in and out in all kinds of ways. I did enjoy watching them because I'd never seen anything like it before. Every 
hadn't said that Queen Elizabeth was interested all the time. In the end, he made her a great big colored cross. All the schools together. When it was all over, and we had heard her speaking to us, we started to cheer again, and we didn't stop. This was the children's time, a happy time. The next event was a visit to the repatriation hospital, to the nurses and their patients. Afterwards, the Queen and Duke walked through the grounds of Anglesey Barracks nearby, where they each planted a tree. The history of the barracks is by far the oldest in Australia. The hill where Queen Elizabeth now turns the earth was first inspected by Governor Macquarie in 1811 and chosen by him as a site for future quarters of the garrison. These trees will add to the rich store of history. But at present, the Duke is more interested in the spade, which was especially plated for the occasion. The little ceremony was perhaps one that Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh enjoyed most. They were quite relaxed and at home after their earlier activities. Their interest was turned towards the monument to men of the Wiltshire Regiment who died in the Maori Wars. But interest of onlookers was centred upon the royal party, who learned that the memorial is the only one in Australia erected by the British to one of their own regiments. It was fitting that on their way out, the Queen and Duke could see some of our early colonial buildings. Built in a strong and simple style, the old officers' quarters have been in use for about 140 years. And the staff headquarters, which date from the 1850s, This day we celebrate our sesquicentenary, the settlement of Hobart in 1804. People of the city, sailors from near and far, have come together in honor of the most important voyage to the shores of Sullivan's Cove. 150 years ago to the day, Collins ordered a landing to be made from his ship in the bay. These yachts now rise and fall where those settlers rode across to the cove. Her Majesty now stands on the site of Hunter Island before unveiling the memorial which marks the actual place of landing.
the ships of Australia, Britain, Canada, and New Zealand came to join in the celebration. On Sunday, many people turned out in the wet to wait patiently along the route to St. David's Cathedral. The Bishop of Tasmania received Queen Elizabeth, who is head of the Church of England. Dean Futrell conducted divine service, and the Duke himself read a lesson. On the same day, we honored the dead. Ex-servicemen and women had gathered in a large area set aside for them in front of the cenotaph. The living remembered the fallen. With respect and sincerity of feeling, all those present recalled the suffering and sorrow of war. The Duke is an ex-serviceman himself. Later, he spoke to the assembly. President, the Queen has asked me to thank you for your message of loyalty and devotion from the ex-service men and women of Tasmania. The Tasmanians have served with courage and distinction in successive wars alongside men from other countries of our great brotherhood of nations. In mud, jungle and desert, at sea and in the air, in adversity and in victory, you have helped to write a story of valor and endurance which you can look back on as second to none. All this has meant a heavy sacrifice and sorrow, but it defeated tyranny and aggression, and more than that, it has given every Australian of present and future generations a new reason to feel proud of their home and their countrymen. The Queen and I join in your homage to the proud memory of those for, those for whom this cenotaph has been erected. And to the living, go our best wishes for a happy and prosperous future. One of the most important occasions of the Queen's visit was the opening of the 30th session of Parliament. For the first time in Tasmania, a reigning sovereign walks to the door of Parliament House. This morning, the practice of centuries links our form of government with the history of democracy in Britain. It has been said that the crown is a symbol of the free association of the members of the Commonwealth. Each nation has the full right to act according to its own government. But all peoples are united together by a common loyalty to the crown. Queen Elizabeth is here to maintain that freedom and unity. The ceremony was a brief but stately one. Seated outside in the showers, we waited for her to reappear. The rain had caused the hood of the car to be drawn up, but although our view was obscured, 
Interest did not slacken. Parliament House had never looked better. The gardens provided a bright setting in spite of the dull day, and the decorations on the building itself were both colourful and dignified. In the afternoon, a garden party was held at Government House. The weather cleared, and people from all walks of life gathered in the ground. Friends drew together, talking lightly, and as they did so, the colours of the women's clothes stood out one against the other, forming a variety of pattern on the green lawn. Out through the trees on the last day of the regatta, a ship sailed through the yacht racing on the harbour. But when the time came for the Queen to appear, the crowd watched her move through the people, enjoying the daylight hours, before she and the Duke spent their last evening in Hobart. And a gay evening it was. The city was sparkling, the streets thronged with people, and over the domain a fireworks display arched through the air. Many of the displays were shown nights later, reminders of the Queen's visit. For the next morning, she bade farewell to her hostess, Lady Cross, and said goodbye to Hobart. From the rolling hills about Cambridge Airport, the royal party flew to the rich northwest to Winyard. The little town made a gay showing in preparation for the day, and I guess it has never seen so many people before. The crowds had gathered from surrounding farms and from outlying districts. Some found it hard to stand quietly, but others had a first-class view down across the airport. The children deserved it. Many had traveled since early morning. The Premier, Mr. Cosgrove, again met Queen Elizabeth at the foot of the gangway and escorted her across the tarmac. It seems that a few photographers flew up, too. The Queen's visit to Wynyard was very brief, only a few minutes. So the people's welcome becomes all the more important when we remember how far some of them had to come. Children came from as far away as Marawa, from little schools, from big schools, and no one was going to stop them from seeing. Queen Elizabeth wore a travelling suit that day, in preparation for the long car drive through 120 miles of town and countryside. The tour of the Northwest had begun. The land is rich with stretching farmlands and quiet homes some mellowed with age and history. English trees cluster where early settlers wished for reminders of their native land. But out in the open, the yellow grasses of summer roll away to the distant hills. The fine clarity of the landscape draws the eye inland to the bold bluffs of the western tiers, 
They lie constant behind the coastal plains, gathering the rains which may become spring flood below. Sheep graze quietly on the drier slopes, yielding their wool in the late months of each year. And across the wide valleys, crops thicken and flower in profusion. The district can support more settlers, and those from Europe have already given allegiance. New Australians joined with old in their homeland. Here at Burnie, the bright sun drew out one young lady in her light summer clothes. An air of festivity ran through the streets. The day before, people had spent from sunrise until after dark adding the last touches. Now Bernie was dressed with miles of flags and festoons, ready for the royal visit to the largest town on the northwest. Each street along the route gave its welcome in a different way. Outside the chambers, representatives of the council stood waiting with a friendly greeting. Mrs. Iris Graham was to hostess the Queen and Duke at lunch. An informal meal so that the royal party would be rested. As Queen Elizabeth went inside, the crowd kept up their gaiety. Travelling along the Bass Highway towards Devonport in the afternoon, the royal party passed through Penguin, one of the little towns which lie nestled between the hills and the sea. It's a popular holiday resort and a commercial centre for the surrounding farms. Devonport, a much larger centre, also serves a fertile country district, the Mersey Valley. It is a busy town and growing, filled with activity. Modern style buildings point out its recent development and the outlook of the people. Since Queen Elizabeth and the Duke were not to stay very long, many people took up their positions early to be sure of a view. Not only in Tasmania, but throughout the Australian tour, children's gatherings were a feature of the displays of loyalty. At the Devonport Oval, school children were given first preference, and as everywhere, they sent up a rousing cheer in their excitement. One boy threw his cap so high that he lost it. And I expect he was not the only one who spent some time searching amongst the crowd. 
But there was a little girl who saw a great deal. Although she was rather nervous, her shyness lent her actions all the more charm. The royal party took a keen interest in the assembly, especially when the children sang in the Queen's honor. with a friendly warmth of feeling which Queen Elizabeth could not miss. And when their chorus came to an end, she spoke of her own and the Duke's gladness that this beautiful part of Tasmania had been included in their tour. The half hour was gone, every moment filled. And now the Queen was to make the final circuit of the Oval. At La Trobe, by the side of the quiet Mersey, afternoon tea was being laid out in the shade. Tables were laden with all sorts of good food, and the grounds were bright with colour, yet cool and inviting. Bell's Parade has always been noted for its beauty. In the fresh setting, Queen Elizabeth could relax completely after the crowded hours of her journey. Under the soft trees, the river moves gently, stretching away beneath their rich green folds. But the Queen's enjoyment could only be brief. Excitement ran again. This pretty little place, Westbury, was originally a convict settlement. The train of cars now passes with ease, where those convicts work laboriously, and where teams of horses plodded through the dust. The convoy continues in unending lines, an indication of the amount of detail which is carefully organized on a royal tour. Under signposts pointing to their homes, children gathered and waved with spirit. The pillars through which we see the Queen's car belong to one of the first hotels erected in Westbury, and bricks made by convicts still form some of the walls. It is not far now to the fine sheep land near Connorville, typical of the Midlands, where the Queen and Duke are to spend the night. The decision to stay with Mrs. O'Connor and her son was made by the Duke, who had once visited the property during wartime. Connorville offered the royal party quiet and rest in a private home, with the pleasure of a beautiful garden, and their privacy was not disturbed.
The welcome from people of a city next day was in direct contrast. Before Queen Elizabeth arrived in Launceston, a little Australian terrier took the stage. He was rather uncertain about royal procedure, and so his dignity was shamefully ruffled. The civic welcome began. For a long time, Launceston had been hearing about the Queen and Duke in Tasmania. Now they were here, in fulfillment of a major duty. Since their last morning on the island was to be spent in this city, the address of loyalty read by the town clerk was also a farewell, expressing the wish that Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh had enjoyed their brief stay in Tasmania and that they might keep happy memories of their visit. The aldermen of Launceston have been in office during an important period in the history of the council. Last year, they celebrated 100 years of administration. Today, a prosperous community watches their presentation before the Queen. When the Queen and Duke left the town hall, they came over to York Park, where we were to give our display. I'd never heard so much cheering, nor seen so many children together before. There were 10,000 of us. We all knew that today was our only chance to see Queen Elizabeth and the Duke, and we were determined to make the most of it. We wanted them to see a display they would remember. The girls' hoop drill was quite complicated in itself. My sister was just to the left of the dais, and I could pick her out all the way through. I'd watched her practice the actions many times before, but it all looked rather different now that there were so many girls together. off the field, we came in to take up our positions for the pyramids. We had to be quick, and I just hoped we'd do everything right.
through the display, I was one of the boys who had to hold someone in the air. You can guess my shoulders were sore when we finished. But there was no time to think about it then. was represented, state schools and private schools, and everyone marched in uniform. Their colors made the most impressive sight of all. My schoolmates were there too, and I shall never forget it. Tasmania, it has been my happy experience to meet and talk with people in many walks of life. But I am particularly glad to have this opportunity of meeting you, the children of Tasmania, in the midst of your own beautiful countryside. Your fine display this morning has given me great pleasure, and I assure you that my husband and I will always remember the loyalty and affection you have shown us. I pray the years to come may serve still further to strengthen the ties of friendship and understanding between our beloved countries. As the Queen and Duke left, we made sure we'd give them a loud farewell, one you could hear all round the hills. At Western Junction Airport, the Queen and Duke stepped... <laughs> Among those who were there to bid them goodbye were the Premier and the Chief Justice, members of Parliament and the heads of the armed services. Queen Elizabeth drew near Dame Gertrude Cosgrove and paused for a few moments to speak to her. Finally, she came to the police escort, whose long, tiring journeys had tested their strength and endurance. Their farewell to the governor and the premier was a farewell to all.
as the Queen left to go to others, she could keep the memory of her island visit and of the good wishes of its people. Yeah.